Good morning. How are y'all this morning? I hope everybody got up to bed this morning, rolled up, saying, Glory, hallelujah. I hope so. That's the way we should be on Sunday morning, knowing that we can come together and worship our Lord, the risen Lord, and uh, know Him in a very personal way. And that's what we hope that you can come to a closer knowledge of who He is today, through song and then through the Word. Uh, welcome you, Stepping Stone Church. We're delighted to have you here. And we hope that you enjoy our worship service today, even though it was taped last night. Be blessed.
opportunity to still be able to meet like this. We praise you, Lord. We hope that your message reaches everybody out there that has access to it. God, we love you. And we thank you so much for the things you provide in times like this. You're amazing. You're so amazing. We love you and we praise you tonight and tomorrow. You're wonderful and we pray. Amen. Amen. Year, in fact, in just a little over a month from now, Connie and I, that's my wife, she and I will have been married 33 years. That in itself is amazing that anybody would put up with me for 33 years. But she has and done a glorious job of it. Amen. The one thing we did though. When we got married, as we pledged our lives to serving our Lord Jesus Christ. And that has been an adventure that has taken us beyond the stars. We have done so much in just serving Him and received so much. I mean, we started off, I started off uh, with a, as a junior high Sunday school teacher and I uh, worked my way up into the senior department, the senior high school department, got demoted to the senior adult department, <laughs> and then got to come back down to the senior high school. Connie's been a, a senior high school teacher for ages. But whatever we did, we wanted to serve the Lord. And when one of the best things that ever happened to us is when we opened our home up to a Brazilian known Pedro Prado. Now, Pedro came to the United States as a foreign exchange student, and he came to a family that had a wreck one week before he got to the United States. A very bad car wreck, totaled their car. The gentleman that was driving it was a buddy of mine, and he... Uh, he was, he was hurt pretty bad. He was requiring surgery. And on Labor Day weekend, was, when his surgery was set to, uh, to kind of correct his back and some other things, but we knew that being in a member of our church and being, bringing Pedro to our church and into my Sunday school department, we knew that they were having a hard time of it. And so we, I had a plan with, uh, to travel with my daughter to the promised land, Texas A&M. Woo! Yes. <laughs> and so I, I went to my buddy and I said, hey, would, would, it, would it help y'all at all if we took Pedro along with us on our trip? And I think it was a big relief to him that we did. And it was a, a glorious trip for us to take. Take Pedro to, yes, we took him to Austin, not to see the other school, but to let him experience the Capitol and Lake Travis and some of those sites, and then take him on him to, uh, to uh, College Station on Saturday. But we had a grand time, and we came back, and uh, Pedro was a great member of our Sunday school class, and unfortunately, about a month into it, he found out that his... Uh, parents there in the U.S. were scheduled to move. His job was transferred and he had to move to the New Brunswick area and Pedro was really disappointed because you can imagine a 16 year old kid coming to the United States, being a senior, not knowing anybody, getting accepted onto the basketball team and having his senior pictures taken and 
ordered his all his graduation stuff. You know they do it so early these days. I don't. I guess they think everybody's going to graduate when we get to be a senior. I don't know. But he did a great job. And but he he had made some friends and he was on the team and he he just didn't feel like he was supposed to move. Well, all that was happening in drama that I really wasn't aware of. But I had gone out of town one day to do business down in the Big Bend area, and I came back that night, and I got this phone call. And it was Pedro, and he said, Will you receive me? Receive you? Like, catch you? What are you talking about? <laughs> No, will you receive me? Will you allow me to come to your house and live with you? And I looked at Connie and said, You do know he's six foot four, 240 pounds, eats like a horse. What do you think? Ah, yeah, Pedro will take you. <laughs> and that was one of the greatest things we ever did. Because we were able to take him in and keep him in into a Sunday school class that taught him about Christ and what it meant to be a Christian. But it was more than that because once he left, he, he was part of my family. And I guess that's federal calling right now. I better <laughs> shut him off. <laughs> now, that's kind of silly when you do that. But anyway... Pedro became one of our family. He was like my adopted son. He didn't have a father growing up. And I kind of took him in. And uh, to the point that two years after he went back home, he got a scholarship to the University of Purdue. And I went up, he would come back on the Christmas break. He'd come down and spend a week with us. And just before he went home, he'd still come down and spend a week with us. And before he went, he'd spend a week with us. So we got three weeks for two years and just really enjoyed him. And then we got the privilege of going down to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil to visit him. And on that trip, I mean, it was glorious. Get this. One half block this way, one half block that way, and we were in the middle of Ipanema Beach. I mean, ooh, and he came from a town of 7 million people to Port of Little Fort Stockton, maybe 600 people. Talk about cultural shock that boy was in, but he did so well. But we, one day we were going down south of town with his uh, mother and his grandmother, and as we were coming back into town, we got, came across him out of the sky and out of the clouds, here come some hang gliders coming down. And they came right over us, just sailing over us. And they went and landed on the beach and just kind of walked off on it. Just, it was a glorious thing to watch. And I hit the guy and said, man, we ought to do that, man. Come on, come on, come on. Just to see what kind of rise I would get out of her. But little did I know that Mama Pedro and Grandma Pedro were in the travel business. And they knew who was the head of that hang gliding place. And by the next morning, I had a reservation to go on a hang glide experience. Boy, was I sure glad it was raining that next day. <laughs> <laughs> and they called and canceled it. And I said, oh, God, thank you. And then they said, oh, but we rescheduled you for the next day. <laughs> And that was great, too, because Pedro got to go with us up there. But I'm telling you, that was, uh, it took us about an hour to go across town, wind our way up 3,000 feet on top of the mountain. And we get out, and here I am with this little guy, and he starts telling me how this is going to work. First of all, he said, have you ever done this before? Uh, no. <laughs> and then he handed me a harness and said, well, it's just like stepping into a diaper. 
Well, at that time, I thought he was a little too chipper, and I was thinking, I may need a diaper right about now. <laughs> <laughs> but then I questioned him, you know, how, how long have you been doing this? Oh, man, I started this summer. I've been doing it all summer. Uh, well, this is just the 1st of July. <laughs> how long have you done this? Oh, don't worry about it, he said. You know, all you have to do is hold on to that harness. And when I say run, you run with all you have as fast as you can down this slope. And I'm standing on the slope. It's like a flat ski slope, about a 45 degree angle. And I'm just kind of sliding as I'm putting on the shoes. And he wants me running down that stuff. And then there's a cliff right there at the end, about 30 yards down. I'm really even having second thoughts about this. But I'd already paid my money. So I said, okay. Now, what do I do again? He said, hold, run, and pray that we have a side for ending. Those three words, hold, run, pray, should never be spoken in the same sentence. <laughs> So I asked him, how do I keep from crashing? You don't. I do that. You? Yeah, me. <coughs> yes, I got choked up that time too. <coughs> I said, I'm thinking, that really doesn't give me too much comfort. I mean, you're, you're half my age, half my size. This is too easy. Don't I have to do something? Don't you let me do anything? You? No. You just hold on. Okay. Oh, trust me. He says. Trust me. Do you have any bangles? <laughs> Only my life. <laughs> You're funny, he jerked. And I remember that, that about that time that my wheel was probably out of date. And just as he was tightening on, I was starting to look down there again, and all of a sudden, without any warning, he just, run, 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 run! And I just took off, man, running as hard as I could. And about that time, John 3.16 came to mind. You know that part that bleeding, never perishing, things like that? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you something. Just like that, when he told me that trust me, I'll do everything, that's what Jesus had told us to do too. Amen. Sounds a little too simple, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. You know, most of us would rather ver uh, gravitate to uh, verbs such as work. That has a better ring to it, doesn't it? Whoever works for him will be saved. Yeah. Satisfies fits in there nicely. You know, whoever satisfies him will be saved. In, order, in short, we're thinking, shouldn't we do more? Shouldn't we do more in order to be saved? You know, Nicodemus was struggling with the same thing. You know, this is who Christ was actually talking to, is Nicodemus here. And Nicodemus was really confused about a few things, you see. And he had just told Nicodemus, you have to be born again. And that Man strikes a scholar and some of us is reminds me of the take a leap Brazilian struck me. And Nicodemus says, What's my part? What do I do? And it's like a, a baby takes a passive role in the birthing process, you know, and an infant allows his parents to kind of take control of him and Take him on the ride. 
But salvation is just as equally simple. God works and we trust. Amen. God works and we trust. And such a thought really troubled Nicodemus. There must be more. Surely I have to do something else. Jesus comforts the visiting professor with an account of the Torah. You know, the Torah was Nicodemus' favorite book, after all. Go back to what he really knows. Let's see what he says. It says, And Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, and so the Son of Man will also be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. That's John 3, 14 through 15. And it's talking about what Moses was told by God back in Numbers. You see, Nicodemus knew this event. He can relate to this event. You know, it's, a, it's cryptic to us because we, we really don't relate to that. I, I imagine most of you, unless you're really a scholar of the book, the Bible, don't really grasp that issue. Why did Jesus proceed with this story before John 3.16? With a reference? To the serpents? How does that play in this deal? Well, the wandering Israelites were groaning about Moses as usual. They were camped on the border of the promised land, and the beneficiaries of four decades of God graciously supplying them all they needed. But the Hebrews sounded off like a bunch of spoiled. I should say, spoiled trust fund brats. You know? Why have you brought us into Egypt to die in the wilderness? Same complaints about the 70th time they voiced it. He'd heard it all before. Ex slaves longing for Egypt, dreaming of the pyramids, dreaming of being around and out of the wasteland and being in the land of the Pharaohs once again. And man, they were vilifying Moses. I mean, they hated that, hated that hot sand. They longed for the days of manna. Days of... I mean, manna. Those loaves of worthless bread, they cried out. They had manna burgers. They had manna casseroles. They had manna pe peanut butter sandwiches. I mean, they had all the manna they could stand. I mean, so the Lord sent a fiery serpent among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. You know, horror movie producers long to spawn such a scene like this. Slithering vipers crawling out of every crack and crevice and hole, serpentining through the camp. People died, corpses Corpses dot the landscape. Survivors plead with Moses. We have sinned. Help us. Help. Pray for us, Moses. So Moses prayed for the people. And then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fairy soap and set it on a pole. And it shall be that if everyone that is bitten, if they will just look upon the serpent on the pole, they will be saved. And it worked. And they lived. Now, this passage is just not a story. It's also a song of promise. Amen. It's a simple promise. Snake bit Israelites, found healing by looking at the pole. Sinners will find healing by looking at the Christ. Amen. You know, everyone who believes in Him will have eternal life. I tell you, too simple. Mm. Just too simple. We can't believe it. Just too simple. Can't happen that way. We expect a more complicated cure. We expect to have elaborate treatments. Moses and followers might have been expecting more as well. 
manufacturing of ointments to be put on, therapeutic lotions to use, shots, vaccines, yes, treat one another, or at least fight back. Let us break out the stones and the sticks and fight back. But doesn't this also sound like what's happening today? Is we have a virus among us and we really don't know what to do about it? Maybe we should trust Him more. Yes. Instead of asking so much of what can you do for me? What can my government do for me? What can my government take away from me? I don't know. We expect to have a more, most of us expect to have more of a proactive um, assignment to get through all this, you know. A more proactive assignment for all to remedy for all of our sin. And some mercy seekers, they climb the cathedral steps on their knees. And some traverse over hot rocks with bare feet, thinking that will help out. And others have written their own Bible verses. God helps those who help himself. That's a popular one. Popular opinion, chapter 1, verse 1. We'll fix ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll make up for our own mistakes with contributions, our guilt with busyness. We'll overcome failures with hard work. We'll find salvation in the old-fashioned way. We'll learn it by God. We'll learn it. Christ, in contrast, says to us the same thing that the Brazilian said to me. Your part is to trust me. Christ says, your part is to quit worrying about it. Your part is to trust me. Mm -hmm. By the way, we take these similar steps every day. We do. I mean, you guys have the chairs out there. You believe when you sat down in that chair that it supports you no matter what you weight, right, Ken? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Amen. <laughs> and you believe that if you drink water, you'll hydrate. So you drink. You believe that when you flip the light switch on, the light's going to come on as long as you pay for the power bill that month. And when you turn the doorknob, you expect that latch to come undone and it's going to let you in. I mean, there's mm -hmm. certain things that we just know and we believe in. Some of us have more faith than others. Mm -hmm. But you know, I remember that that pair of gliding partner of mine. As I took the plunge off that mountain. He said, trust in me. You know, at that point, he's the only one of the two of us that was smiling. Because <laughs> all I know is when he said, run, 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 I started running. And that, the end of that cliff was coming closer and closer, a bit of a step. And when I was only about three feet from it, all of a sudden, that parachute filled with the air. And all of a sudden, it just lifted us up. I mean, I would swear I had two, just a, oh, I mean, too close for comfort. <laughs> and it just lifted us up, and we started floating. And I'm going to tell you, that was one of the greatest feelings I've ever felt. And I would almost compare it to what I'm going to feel like when I get into heaven, in paradise. As we looked down, and we floated down 3,000 feet. 
and two miles away onto the beach. And we had a soft moon. He told me to trust in him. And Christ is telling you to trust in him. That's amazing. Now, today you're only three words away. I was only three steps away, but you're only three words away from salvation. Trust in me. Trust in me. Trust. Believe in me. That's what Jesus asked of us. It's that simple. It's that simple. And guess what? When you reply the correct way, what Jesus says is, but just hang with me. You're running with the big dogs now. Just lean back and trust on me all the way. Well, I guess the question is, would you take that leap of faith today? Would you take that leap of faith today? Say, Jesus, I'm going to trust you. Not just halfway, but with my whole heart, my whole mind, and my whole soul. I want to trust in you. Now, see, that's what John 3 16 is all about. It says, believe and then receive. Because when you come to rest, we're going to be on the beach in paradise. Now what do you do? You might know, know some of you out there may be listening and you don't know about Christ that much. And this simple con concept of just trusting in Him and believing in who He said and what He promised in John 3, 16 is almost alien to you. I'm telling you right now, if you will take those few steps, this crowd's gone. I believe in your son. I believe that he came down from earth, down from heaven to earth. And I believe that he had a ministry here. And I believe that he went to that cross and he arose out of that grave. And I believe, I believe, I believe. And who you are, Christ. God's going to open his arms wide. And he's going to welcome you into the family of God. Now, some of you aren't quite there yet. I'm going to encourage you to read the Gospel of John. And I think if you'll read that, you might come to an understanding of who Christ really is. And you'll come to the point where you can say, I trust in you, Jesus. I believe in you, Jesus. And then God's going to open wide and he's going to smile on you and say another Adopted child is coming my way. Thank you for being with us this morning at Stepping Stone Church. I hope you enjoyed the service. I hope you'll come back on Wednesday nights. And I hope that you'll be here with us next week. Because we enjoy bringing this to you. And I hope that you're getting something out of it. Because I love Jesus. And he's meant so much to me and has brought me so many great experiences as I seek him out and I seek to serve him. And I just want to be so close to him every day. Good night. I should say good morning. Have a great day. Be blessed.